be able to ask that later. But uh, we have an exciting program today, but I am one of two interruptions before we get to the program, and I will, however, be very brief. Chancellor Tolley, way back in the 50s, said, a good university can't exist without a good library. And in so doing, with several other people, uh, started a group called Syracuse University Library Associates to benefit the library and special collections. And that is what we do, that is what we exist for. Today's a special day, not only because of the program, but if you are a member, after this, we're having a special event at the bookstore where members will get 25% uh, off of general books and collegiate apparel. And I know most everyone here would look great in a number 44 <laughs> jersey. So uh, if you're a member, bear that in mind and come over and browse after the event. And uh, the other, one of the other important benefits, and this this is on the back table, a little bit outdated, but it has most of the essential information if you're not a member about being a member and what the benefits are. And one other key one I want to mention, which is that all of these lectures have been videotaped and are currently available free on the SU website through the library. In the future, it's going to be, uh, it's going to require a password and it's going to require being a member. So. We hope you'll take advantage, if you want to go back and see the ones that are currently taped, you're, you have free access, but in the future we're going to have more exciting programs like this, and to access them you need to be a member. And also, if you're a member of the Library Associates at a patron level or above, which is currently only $100, you get library privileges. And I know there's a lot of faculty here, so they don't need that, but <laughs> faculty also want to have good libraries. So we encourage you to do that. And it, among our tremendous pieces in the special collection is one that really hit home to me recently because I participated in a Holocaust remembrance this week. And it, it is that we have photographs, original photographs in special collections that were taken by Margaret Bourke White when she was following, going with Patton's army in World War II and when they entered Buchenwald concentration camp. So it's only one of many very special things that we help enable the, the library to collect by being, uh, by, by existing and being uh, part of this university library. So I think with that, I believe I've covered all those things that I needed to cover as president of the, of the SU Library Associates Board, and I'm now going to introduce Dorothea Nelson, who will get us to the main event. Thank you. I am the second interruption before we <coughs> get to Elizabeth and Malcolm Ingram. Before I give a real introduction to them, I just want to say a little bit about Mary Marshall, who is known, I'm sure, <coughs> to everybody here, much beloved. She was one of the founders of Library Associates, and she remained quite an active force in that group for well over 50 years. She was the first female tenured professor at SU. Um, unfortunately, in the days when she turned 65, there was a mandatory retirement. Mary never wanted to retire. She went on to teach um, in the Humanistic Studies program, something she loved because people who were there because they wanted to be. She never had to give a test. She didn't have to grade anything. And that course, which started sometime in the in 1970s, grew huge. I was in that group for a long, long time, one of many who came an hour early to be sure I got a seat. And many friendships were born out of that um, humanistic studies program that she taught. She had an enthusiastic and devoted following, unlike anything many of us have experienced. Um, but to get to today, Shakespeare's birthday, Elizabeth Ingram is with us. She's an associate professor in SU's Department of Drama in the College of Visual and Performing Arts, where she teaches acting, scene study, voice, and verse. She is also an equity actress in both Great Britain and the United States. She studied at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. She is a designated Chris, <coughs> excuse me, Kristen Linklater voice teacher, actor, and director 
a trained body work therapist, and I would really love to know what that means, <laughs> and has performed on British television in London's West End and England's National Theater. For the SU Drama Department, among other credits, she has directed Rookery Nook, The Greeks, The Importance of Being Earnest, Dancing at Lugasa, The Misanthrope, and Blood Wedding. At Mary Marshall's memorial service in September 2009, many of us will remember Liz as the person chosen by Mary to read a favorite Shakespearean passage from Antony and Cleopatra. Age cannot wear her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. How appropriate it is to have us with you, you with us today, Mary. And Malcolm Ingram is an assistant professor <coughs> in the Department of Drama in SU's College of Visual and Performing Arts as well, where he teaches scene study and voice and verse. An equity actor in England and in the United States, he has studied at London Central School of Speech and Drama Center. His many credits include an appearance as the narrator in Shakespeare and the Symphony, at the Syracuse Civic Center, Falstaff and the Merry Wives of Windsor. Windsor, they must have stuffed you quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and Melrose Wilton in the award-winning Enchanted April, which was done at the Shakespeare and Company Theater in Lenox, Massachusetts. He too is a designated Kristen Linkladder voice teacher, and for SU Drama, he has directed, among many other productions, an all-female cast in Henry V, Charlie's Aunt, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and this season, The Way of the World. He was a guest at Mary Marshall's popular humanistic study courses at several occasions. Both Liz and Malcolm were actors in one of the very successful programs put on by Library Associates in two, uh, Mary Beth, help me with the date. 1999, thank you. Uh, the Albert Schweitzer collection uh, that drew 500 people to the performance at what was then uh, still old crowds. We are delighted to have them with us today to offer a dramatic presentation of selected Shakespearean sonnets. Uh, I know there's going to be an enthusiastic response, but I urge you to wait and applaud at the conclusion of their presentation. Thank you so much and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, they can't. Can you hear? If you if you just put up your hand, then um, that would be great, and then we'll just project. We'll, we'll project a bit more. <laughs> Can you hear now? Oh, good, yes. good. Yes, just so just April twenty third, fifteen sixty four. All together. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, William Shakespeare. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary Beth and Kathleen, for inviting us. It's great to see um, a lot of friendly, familiar faces. We feel very honored to um, be asked to take part in this lecture series bearing the name of that extraordinary and wonderful woman, Mary Marshall. In her love of literature, and particularly Shakespeare, um, Mary was an inspiration to, to many of us, and she's very, she's very much missed in this community. This first sonnet, I think, is one that Mary would have particularly appreciated. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. But you shall live, but you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time. When wasteful war shall statues overturn and broils root out the work of masonry, nor Mars his sword, 
nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory. Against death and all oblivious enmity shall you pace forth. Your praise shall still find room even in the eyes of all posterity. that wear this world out to the ending doom. So, till the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this and dwell in lover's eyes. In um, Elizabethan times, in Shakespeare's time, um, actors had a pretty rough time. Uh, the major theatre companies in London uh, did apparently between 30 and 40 productions a year each. And Syracuse Stage does, what, seven or eight. And also, um, we're led to believe that the actors had between three and four days rehearsal for each production. Which is very different from the six to ten weeks that, you know, a major company would now have to rehearse a Shakespeare play. Mm -hmm. And the, the actors may have known the story, but they would never have seen the script before. They, uh, they were never given the whole play. They were just given their own parts with their sides, but they never actually had the whole play in front of them. And they played in open-air theatres with uh, very little scenery, no stage lighting, no director, it sounds like the actor's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so we are both actors, and uh, we teach in the drama department, and we thought it might be interesting to look at some of the ways in which Shakespeare, who was an actor himself, helped the actors by giving them uh, keys and uh, directions in the text, in the actual text themselves. And uh, this helped the actors to, to bring his plays to life. So first of all, uh, let's hear from Shakespeare himself the valuable advice that he gave to an actor in Hamlet. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so o'erdone is from the purpose of play, which, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature. So, uh, the modern playwrights, they give their actors uh, sometimes quite copious stage directions and descriptions of the characters. So um, I'm just going to read you a bit from uh, A Streetcar Named Desire, Tennessee Williams. And this is his description of Blanche when she comes in. Uh, Blanche comes round the corner, carrying a valise. She looks at a slip of paper, and then at a building, and then at again at the slip again, and, at, and then at the building. And her expression is one of shocked disbelief. Her appearance is incongruous in this setting. She is daintily dressed in a white suit with a fluffy bodice, necklace and earrings of pearl, white gloves and hat, looking as if she were arriving at a summer tea or cocktail party in the garden district. She is about five years older than Stella. Her delicate beauty must avoid a strong light. There is something about her uncertain manner, as well as her white clothes, that suggests a moth. So if I'm playing Blanche, I've got a lot to go on with all that, yes. A lot to fill, a lot of fun stuff. Shakespeare gives you nothing. He says he's a king or he's a, um, a daughter, perhaps, but that's all, nothing at all. 
So um, then you say, well, so how did the actors cope? And then you begin to find, as you study the text, that in the text, all the way through the text, uh, there are stage directions that Shakespeare has given, and copious, uh, delicate, specific stage directions about how he wants the character to behave and how he wants that scene to go and how he wants the build of the scene. I mean, minute directions, if you know how to look for them. So what we are going to do is to um, perhaps engage you in looking at the text and um, finding out these hidden stage directions that Shakespeare gives his actors. At the time we were invited to give this talk, we were rehearsing for a recital of Shakespeare's sonnets. And it occurred to us that the sonnets would be a very good way of going through the text or exploring the text with you. They are like little plays. I think they're about to remount off Broadway an evening of seven short plays written by seven separate playwrights based on seven, seven separate sonnets, which I think first came, happened a few years ago. And I heard that they were about to do that again. So each sonnet is, a, is there is a dramatic situation within each sonnet. And most of the textual and verbal challenges that come up for the actor when working on the plays also appear in the sonnets, but in a more concentrated form. So, using the sonnets, let's look at some of these hidden directions which Shakespeare gives to the actor. The verse form Shakespeare uses in the sonnets, and I'm sure most of you know this, and in his plays, for the most part, is iambic pentameter. That's five pairs of syllables in each line. The first syllable of each pair is unstressed, and the second syllable is stressed. Ten syllables in all, sometimes eleven. And the rhythm goes, di-dum, 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 di-dum. Just like the regular heart. The thing about blank verse, at least I find, it's very close to naturalistic speech. I am big pentameter. Right? <laughs> so this regular heartbeat that goes boom, 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 because the text is in this I am big pentameter, it makes it for the actor very easy to learn, much easier to learn than prose. So that's one of the helpful things that Shakespeare gives the actor. Here's a few examples um, from the sonnets. Uh, of what we call the regular, the regular rhythm, a, a line in the written in the regular, a line written to be spoken in the regular rhythm. When I do count the clock that tells the time, alas, tis true I have gone here and there. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And from the plays, and of course we could quote from anything in the plays, but. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. The quality of mercy is not strength. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. But now, what's most interesting about Shakespeare's verse are the variations, where the regular iambics <coughs> become irregular. And this <coughs> always indicates for the actor a shift in feeling. Mark Antony doesn't say, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. He says, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And this irregularity in the rhythm helps him, of course, get hold of that crowd, because that's what he needs to do. In the next line, the second line, he's probably got, gained more control, so the next line is much more regular. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. And likewise, Juliet, um, she doesn't say, gallop a pace, you fiery footed steeds. She doesn't say that. She says, gallop a pace, you fiery footed steeds. And this irregularity, we feel her passion and her need to get going with, with the, the next scene. In sonnet number 12, the fifth line reads, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves. It's not when lofty trees I see barren of leaves. And... That, the fact that there's a stressed syllable where a weak one should normally be helps the shock value of that particular word. 
when lofty trees I see, barren of leaves. It's a bit like to be or not to be. That is the question. It just cuts across the rhythm and jumps out at you. I'll read the whole song. There's about two or three places in the sonnet where, where it becomes irregular. When I do count the clock that tells the time, and see the brave day <coughs> sunk in hideous night, when I behold the violet past prime, and sable curls all silvered o'er with white, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, born on the bier with white and bristly beard. Then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake, and die as fast as they see others grow. And nothing against time's scythe can make defense, save breed to brave him when he takes thee hence. Mm -hmm. And this brings us to another of Shakespeare's uh, directions, and that's in the consonants and the vowels. So again, in Juliet's line, um, it's the sounds of the words and the repetition of the words that help the actor to um, reveal the urgency. So she says, gallop apace, you fiery footed steeds, and these g, p, ch, f, f, t, help to get that energy across. Another example, Henry V, when he's trying to inspire, urgently inspire his men to fight. Um, there are three lines. In peace, this little bit starts off, in peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. So there's two things here. Those first two lines are very, very regular. But then we get to, but when the blast of war blows in our ears, and that mid-change, that change of rhythm in the middle of the line, um, it just jumps out at you. Helps with the urgency. Likewise, the, the repetition of blast and blows, and the ears, you know, you've got these repetitions of these sounds, explosive ones, and imitate the action of the tiger. Lots of Lots of repetition of, of explosive little sounds, which just help. So the actor knows to, to look for that. Um, it's going to help him create that character in that situation. So um, I'm going to go into um, Sonnet 29, which you've got on your sheet. There, um, the, on your sheet, there, there are all the sonnets that we're working on, and you, um, you might like, to, hey, might like to, to look at them. Um, so, uh, Sonnet 29 begins, When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. So these two lines, they're uh, pretty regular iambics there. And then you come to the third line and something strange happens. And trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. So I don't want to say, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. It's not going to work. I have to go with the irregularity and the irregularity of and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries helps me as an actor to feel that maybe I'm angry with heaven, that fierceness there. So I hear this irregularity and I recognize that the heartbeat has changed and that there's an emotional shift. And looking at the vowels and the consonants, this is an extraordinary sonnet, as they, they all are. But, um, it starts with these two funny little words, went in, went in, went in, and then it plunges into disgrace. And these d, gr, s, went in, disgrace. And it takes me to a place of such profound deepness and darkness and pain in that disgrace. I don't know when uh, you were last feeling that you were in disgrace. It's a very hard place to be, disgrace. 
with fortune and men's eyes. Now I could say it like that, men's eyes, and it's gone. Or as it's written, it's men's eyes. I can't say that fast, men's eyes. And as I say men's eyes, I get the sense of these eyes, men, looking at me in disgrace. And the, the pain of that, the humiliation of that, and then the next line starts with the same word, but in a different context, I. And then it goes to all alone. And these L's and N's, all alone, is so profoundly lonely. So it's the disgrace, and it's being judged and looked at by men's eyes. And I in this place, so lonely in this place, be weep is a funny word. Be weep. He doesn't say cries. He doesn't say weeps. He says be weep. And then the line ends on my outcast state. Americans say outcast. I say in my English accent outcast. Outcast gives me so much more to play with. So outcast. Maybe there's an anger there. Maybe there's a frustration there. So. In these two lines, without me having to have done anything, no actor's work, but just listening to the lines, I get the scenario of me being in this place, this hard place, being judged by other people, the loneliness of it, and my anger of being in this place. And then the next line is, and trouble, death, heaven, who never answers when I want my bootless cries. So let me do the whole sonnet. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I, all alone, beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope. With what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet, in these thoughts, myself almost despising, happily I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark, at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Here's a sonnet with a very, very different mood, different feel. How oft, when thou, my music, music playest upon that blessed wood whose motion sounds with thy sweet fingers when thou gently swayest the wiry concord that mine ear confounds, do I envy those jacks that nimble leap to kiss the tender inward of thy hand? whilst my poor lips, which should that harvest reap, at the wood's boldness by thee blushing stand. To be so tickled, they would change their state and situation with those dancing chips, o'er whom thy fingers walk with gentle gait, making dead wood more blessed than living lips. Since saucy jacks so happy are in this, give them thy lip, give them thy fingers, <laughs> me thy lips to kiss. <laughs> So by exploring the change in the iambic pattern and listening, seeing the consonants and the vowels and the repetitions therein, the actor can discover more quickly the subtle changes in the thoughts and the feelings. As I expect you know, each sonnet has 14 lines, three groups of four lines with a couplet at the end. The rhyming scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. 
and there's a natural build within that structure. <coughs> Each sonnet is a passionately reasoned argument. As you listen to sonnet 57, notice how the sonnet builds from the first four lines into the second four lines, into the third four lines, to the couplet at the end. The actor feels how this builds the argument. <coughs> Being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire? I have no precious time at all to spend, nor services to do till you require, nor dare I chide the world without end hour, whilst I, my sovereign, watch the clock for you, nor think the bitterness of absence sour, when you have bid your servant once adieu. Nor dare I question with my jealous thought where you may be or your affairs suppose, but like a sad slave, stay and think of naught save where you are, how happy you make those. So true a fool is love, that in your will, Though you do anything, he thinks no ill. Here's another kind of argument. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. <coughs> Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are dumb. If hairs be wires, Black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses, Damas, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. <laughs> the argument in the sonnet, and for that matter in Shakespeare's speeches, begins with a premise which might take anything from one to four lines, or sometimes even longer which is then elaborated and debated within the body of the sonnet. And in the case of the sonnets, it's, it concludes with a rhyming couplet at the end. Here's a sonnet where the premise is actually contained in the first line. Uh, it's a question, and then the rest of the sonnet answers that question. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not change, shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. <coughs> Another one of these hidden keys which, with which Shakespeare provides the actor is the, the importance of the last word in the iambic line. We have a modern ha we have a, a habit nowadays of dropping the ends of our thoughts. <coughs> but if the actor emphasizes and lifts the last word of the line, it takes the thought forward and, if you like, acts as a springboard into the next line. So, Lizzie, read the first four lines of Sonnet 34, 
and just drop the ends of the lines. Why didst thou promise such a beauteous day? <laughs> and make me travel forth without my cloak, to let base clouds o'ertake me on my way, hiding thy bravery in their rotten smoke. Right, now do the hooks on it, and keeping the thought going through to the end of the line, and lift the last word. Why didst thou promise such a beauteous day and make me travel forth without my cloak to let base clouds o'ertake me on my way, hiding thy bravery in their rotten smoke? Tis not enough that through the cloud thou break to dry the rain on my storm-beaten face, for no man well of such a salve can speak that heals the wound but cures not the disgrace. Nor can thy shame give physic to my grief, though thou repent. Yet I have still the loss. The offender's sorrow shows but weak relief to him who bears the strong offense's cross. Oh, but those tears of pearl which thy love sheds. And they are rich and ransom all ill deeds. And here's sonnet 44. If the dull substance of my flesh were thought, injurious distance should not stop my way. For then, despite of space, I would be brought from limits far remote where thou dost stay. No matter then, although my foot did stand upon the farthest earth removed from thee, for nimble thought can jump both sea and land as soon as think the place where he would be. But, ah, oh, thought kills me that I am not thought to leap large lengths of miles when thou art gone, but that so much of earth and water wrought, I must attend time's leisure with my moan, receiving naught by elements so slow, but heavy tears, badges of either's woe. So the forward momentum through the verse is implicit in the iambic rhythm of the word, the line, and the arc of the whole thought. Shakespeare asks us to connect to this forward passion that drives the thought forward, building it through the lines. Sonnet 129. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action, and till action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight, past reason hunted, and no sooner had, past reason hated, as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit and in possession so, had, having, and in quest to have extreme, a bliss in proof, and proved a very woe. Before a joy proposed, behind a dream, all this the world well knows, yet none knows well, to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. And then uh, sonnet 144. Two loves I have of comfort and despair which like two spirits do suggest me still. The better angel is a man, right fair. The worser spirit, a woman, colored ill. To win me soon to hell, my female evil tempteth my better angel from my side and would corrupt my saint to be a devil, 
wooing his purity with her foul pride, and whether that my angel be turned fiend, suspect I may, though not directly tell, for being both from me, both to each friend, I guess one angel in another's hell. Yet this shall I ne'er know, but live in doubt, till my bad angel fire my good one out. Shakespeare uses antithesis a lot. Antithesis being the setting up of opposites against one another, or the setting up of one word or, or one phrase against another. For example, in the previous sonnet. The better angel is a man, right fair, the worser spirit, a woman, coloured ill. And in sonnet 129, which I just did, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. A bliss in proof, and proved a very woe. Before a joy proposed, behind a dream. It's a clever way of expressing complex thoughts and feelings, sometimes within one line, and and often using wit and humour to make a point. So here's a sonnet full of antithesis, which explores very well the situation of someone who has conflicting feelings. No more be grieved at that which thou hast done. Roses have thorns, and silver fountains mud. Clouds and eclipses stain both moon and sun and loathsome canker lives in sweetest bud. All men make faults, and even I in this, authorizing thy trespass with compare, myself corrupting, salving thy amiss, excusing thy sins more than thy sins are. For to thy sensual fault I bring incense, thy adverse party, is thy advocate, and gainst myself a lawful plea commence. Such civil war is in my love and hate that I, an accessory, needs must be to that sweet thief who sourly robs from me. We're focusing on the sonnets, <coughs> we're focusing on the sonnets, but we couldn't resist doing a bit of the scene from Richard III between Richard and Lady Anne, which is absolutely riddled with antithesis. Didst thou not kill this king? I grant you, yea. Dost grant me, hedgehog? <laughs> then God grant me too, thou mayst be damned thee for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous. The better for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven, where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that hoped to send him thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber. <laughs> Ill rest betide the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie with you. I hope. So. I know so. <laughs> because Shakespeare's characters use the language to reveal their feelings, the actor has to own the words and connect them to himself on as deep a level as possible. Um, one way to do this is to lie down on the floor or to sit quietly and just to keep repeating the word, each word, letting it affect you on, a, on a, a gut level, by associating it with images, memories, feelings, until you really can see it, taste it, touch it, and find its meaning. Um, the actor does this, you can do this alone, or the actor can do it with a pun. Give you a little, very brief. Demo. Sometimes we call this dropping in, and Malcolm and I work a lot with a, a company in Massachusetts called uh, Shakespeare and Company, and um, we do this process for every single word in the entire script, 
and it takes the whole first um, week of rehearsal to do it and drives us all mad, but um, I, I, I think there's probably uh, something to be got out of it. So I'll, I'll just show you a bit of this, um, this process of dropping in, letting the word drop deep right down into one's gut. So I'll say the word and ask Malcolm to repeat it and then ask him some questions and, um, and so we go. And I'll just do um, uh, three or four words with this. Let yourself breathe and connect the word to the breath. Winter. 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 Do you enjoy the winter? Winter. Winter. Have we just been through a very long winter? Winter. Winter. Do you like the cold? Winter. Winter. What do your spirits do in the winter? Winter. Pleasure. Pleasure. What gives you pleasure? pleasure? Pleasure. Do you like to laugh? Pleasure. Pleasure. Who are your friends? Pleasure. Pleasure. Are they here in this room? Pleasure. Pleasure. Freezing. Freezing. What's it feel like to be freezing? Freezing. What do your toes feel like when they're freezing? Freezing. What do your spirits feel like when they're frozen, freezing? Freezing. Dark days. Dark days. What's it like to be without the sunshine? Dark days. Dark days. What are those depression times like? Dark days. Dark days. Summer. Summer. Do you enjoy the summer? Summer. Summer. Do you like being in the sun? Summer. Summer. What are you going to do this summer? Summer. Summer. What games do you play in the summer? Summer. Summer. Do you like being by the sea? Summer. Summer. So this is a process we just go through. <laughs> <laughs> and now Mark will just take it into the, into the summer. Yeah, I'll imagine I've just done this for the whole of Sonnet 90... 97. Seven. <coughs> How like a winter hath my absence been from thee. The pleasure of the fleeting year. What freezings have I felt? What dark days seen? What old December's bareness everywhere? And yet this time removed was summer's time. The teeming autumn, big with rich increase, Bearing the wanton burden of the prime, like widowed wombs after their lord's decease. Yet this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit. For summer and his pleasures wait on thee, and thou away the very birds are mute. Or, if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. So, um, we'd just like to recap um, on these Shakespeare's hidden directions. We started with the iambic pentameter and how the regular and irregular rhythms revealed changes of thought and feeling. We looked at the consonants and the vowels and the repetition of those sounds. The importance of the last word of the line. The forward movement and the build of the argument. The use of antithesis. And last but not least, the, the deep personal connection to the words. So we'll um, put it all together and read you uh, the last few sonnets. From you have I been absent in the spring, when proud pied April, dressed in all his trim, hath put a spirit of youth in everything, that heavy Saturn laughed and leapt with him. Yet nor the lays of birds, nor the sweet smell of different flowers in odour and in hue, could make me any summer's story tell, or from their proud lap 
pluck them where they grew. Nor did I wonder at the lilies white, nor praise the deep vermilion of the rose. They were but sweet, but figures of delight, drawn after you, you pattern of all those. Yet seemed it winter still, and you away, as with your shadow, I with these did play. Alas, tis true, I have gone here and there, and made myself a motley to the view, gored mine own thoughts, sold cheap what is most dear, made old offences of affections new. Most true it is that I have looked on truth askance and strangely, but by all above, these blenches gave my heart another youth, and worse essays proved thee my best of love. Now all is done, have what shall have no end. Mine appetite I never more will grind on newer proof to try an older friend a God in love, to whom I am confined. Then give me welcome, next my heaven the best, even to thy pure and most, most loving breast. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, even though his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come, love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. When I consider everything that grows, holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth naught but shows whereon the stars in secret influence comment, when I perceive that men as plants increase, cheered and checked even by the self-same sky, vaunt in their youthful sap at height decrease, and wear their brave state out of memory. Then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you most rich in youth before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay to change your day of youth to solid night, and all in war with time for love of you. As he takes from you, I engraft you new. So we're coming to the, the, um, the last sonnet. Like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end each changing place with that which goes before. In sequent toil, all forwards do contend. Nativity, once in the main of light, crawls to maturity, where with being crowned, crooked eclipses gainst his glory fight, and time that gave doth now his gift confound. Time doth transfix the flourish set on youth, and delves the parallels in beauty's brow, feeds on the rarities of nature's truth, 
And nothing stands but for his scythe to mow. And yet to times in hope my verse shall stand, praising thy worth despite his cruel hand. Oh, I think we chose ones. I think we just chose ones we, we liked and had a strong connection to. Uh -huh. But then we did switch them. You know, if, if it didn't quite work yeah. out in terms of the order. You know, I think it was pretty subjective uh, choice in the, in the, of the ones we chose. Because there were a lot we wanted to put in that we couldn't. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So when his planes were first put on, you said there was no director. Who taught how to speak these lines? Was it Shakespeare himself or the senior actors? How did that? Get yes, started? I do think that. I, mean, I think you. I think I think actors did learn from. Certainly, that that was in my own case. I learnt, I learnt from from wiser and more experienced actors. You know, who who, you pick up the rhythm. You pick up. They they teach you. Yes. I at think that time, of course, everybody. I mean, anybody who was educated. Well, I suppose. The men of that particular class who were educated, grew up speaking, you know, grew up with rhetoric, speaking in public. It was very, it was common. It was, it was a familiar habit. Um, so, I, you know, that would have made it easier. It, was, it wasn't as though they were coming to something completely foreign. And I heard a wonderful thing about um, Elizabethan times. People didn't read to themselves quietly in a corner. They, they read out loud, and, and these plays were meant to be performed. He, Shakespeare, is, as an actor, he wrote these plays not to be looked at quietly and discussed in little groups, you know, but boom, read, read. So I think that was, that was the, the, the media that, that everybody worked in. So you were used to voicing your thoughts and feelings. Although there wasn't a director, I think there probably was, as you say, there was a senior actor or somebody in the company would probably have some kind of overall view yes. of the production, yes. I would imagine. I, hard to imagine a play without any kind of eye on the outside putting it together in some way. Yes. So, Is there no progression through the sonics? Are there no groupings? <coughs> there are, are indeed. Just all yes. No, they're yeah, all, there, there are. are indeed groupings. We, we, didn't, we, didn't, we ignored that. So there we, there we are. Just there, there, there's a whole. There's a, there, there are clusters of sonnets which are focused on different things. It's all. A, it's such a matter of conjecture. You know, nobody really knows. The, um, you know, scholars have been writing books and debating for years about who they're directed to. Some, a lot of the early ones are directed to a young man, probably his patron, the Earl of Southampton. They think that's <coughs> who they were directed to. Shakespeare seems to have had a crush on. A lot of the later ones seem to be directed to this woman. You know, she's often called the dark lady of the sonnets. And we, nobody knows who she was. And then there's um, that one Lizzie read, Two Loves I Have, is, brings them both together. There's this sort of terrible triangle. Of the young man who's betrayed Shakespeare by going off with the, the older woman. So there's certainly that division. And there are, there are other groupings within the sonnets, you know, where um, the whole, a lot in the first 20 or so are about encouraging this young man to have children. Uh, there are other ones which are about being away from somebody, being apart. We didn't do too many of the, the really dark ones. Um, towards the end, there are some really painful ones. Uh, which deal with uh, you know a, a relationship just gone seriously bad, which is full of you know anger and negativity and potential violence. They, they really do cover the, they cover a huge spectrum. 
it's quite fun to, to read them through from beginning to end and, and, and trace that journey that you were wondering about. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, you wonder what we made of what? The tendency towards hypersyllabic lines, specifically the feminine ending is used in your example. Yeah, the feminine ending, that's when there's a, an extra syllable in, on the end of the, the line, you know? To be or not to be, that is, that is the question. So there's that little extra syllable. It, it usually occurs when, um, when the character's got a lot to say. There aren't too many of them in the sonnets. Because the sonnets are very compact. So there's usually 10 syllables in a line in the sonnet. But in the, in the plays, in, there, there's an awful lot of 11 syllable lines. It usually means the character's overflowing with ideas, that things are, it means that the character's very animated. There's something, there's a lot at stake, the state of high excitement when you get a lot of long lines like that? Or if it doesn't end, if, if there's that extra beat, you feel that the character is, is not quite sure of where it's going to go next, so it, it leaves a sort of hiatus, which um, that's fun for an actor to pick up, you know. I mean, again, it's all surmising. It's what it, what it's, it's what it, as you speak it out loud, it's what it feels like. You know? Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, the thing that always amazes me is that um, no one seems to point out too often uh, the kind of tongue-in-cheek that Shakespeare has in his sonnets. His love of, occasionally even his love of puns shows yes. its head. And uh, I wondered if you could comment on that. Did, did you hear too many puns? Did you hear any puns today? No, I don't no. recall them. Well, uh, there is absolutely. I mean, the... the there is a grain of, I think there's a, a grain of humor through all the sonnets. John Barton, you know, the, the English director who, something of an expert on speaking Shakespeare. He did a whole TV series about it and, you know, worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company for a long time. As far as the, when, the, when he was talking about the sonnets, he always, he always said there's the situation in the sonnet and then it's as though the speaker is like one step removed from that situation. He's not actually reliving it as he's speaking. He's slightly, some, I think that applies to some sonnets more than others, but that thing of just being slightly detached, you know? And that's where he gets his tongue in cheek. That's yeah, right, yeah, yeah, because yeah. of that slight objectivity that, you know, even with you know, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. I mean, you could even see there that there's a... Slightly over the top. Th there's a sense of you're, you're commenting on something that you've done or you do, and you're slightly exaggerating it for the, you know, with, with a degree of humor. So, yeah, absolutely, that sense mm -hmm. of... And antithesis. I mean, I, I think that, that little tiny bit we did from uh, Richard Ann. You know, it is fierce, but there's there's wit and there's um, cleverness there. I think I think probably we didn't bring it out as much because we were trying to point out these other um, uh, various points. You know, but there's oh yeah, there's a lot of humour, isn't there, in, in his text? Otherwise, the audience just get bored. You read one that I have a little trouble with, and I wonder if that's on the cheek. He was addressing the thing to a dark lady. I think she's supposed to be a wife or something to tie it up. He talks about her gun breasts, her black wires on her head, and how her breath reeks. Right. And that's a love point. <laughs> yes, but the, the point... Sun must be closing out. <laughs> but I think that the... Yes, that's right. I think that what he's saying is... What the speaker is saying is... The woman I love does not look like the front, co the front cover of Vogue magazine. Or she doesn't look like the fashionable um, idea of what beauty is at this particular time. 
and presumably at Shakespeare's time, you had to be blonde. Uh, you had to have rosy cheeks like Snow White. Um, your breath... It's, it's a... It's a he's, he's commenting... It's almost a parody of... He's sending up that idea of beauty, but also the kind of poetry which said, you know, y y your breath is like... Per what is it? I mean, if we take every one, you, you can say... Um, So, you know, your, your eyes are like the sun, your, your lips are like coral, your, your breasts are your snow white, um, your, your hairs are wires, meaning that they, your, hairs, your hair is spun gold, um, your cheeks are damasked red and white, the, the, there's the perfume of your breath is so sweet, uh, when you speak it's like music, um, and when you walk it's like a goddess floating across the grass. You know, and he's saying this is a, this is bullshit. This is absolute bullshit. What? He hopes he's going to read this. Well, I know it's a little bit double-edged. You know, she might not be terribly flattered. <laughs> no, absolutely, there is, no, there is a <coughs> sure, sure. There's a double edge there. It slightly goes to a little too far the other way, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I think Cassie's wanting to. Tea and buns, I think. Oh, I think, is it time for tea, is it? No. Um, well, well, thank you, thank you very much yeah. for coming. Yeah. Um, remember, there is, um, library associates members can take advantage of this reduction in cost at at the bookstore just across the way and there's a reception for everybody there so we hope you will all repair to the bookstore for more conversation and again so many thanks to you wherever Mary is smiling <laughs> thank you very much so do you two argue in uh, your own language or in Shakespeare's? <laughs> there must be a time though when he said he would say it.